2011 was a watershed moment in Tunisian politics. That year, the country's nearly 60-year dictatorship came to an abrupt end in the wake of a wave of civil unrest, now commonly known as the Arab Spring. Yet the success of Tunisia's Arab Spring hinged on an unlikely actor, labor unions. By organizing strikes across the country that highlighted the political and economic corruption of the regime, labor unions transformed what began as a series of local protests into a nationwide movement opposing authoritarian rule, with workers and citizens across the country calling for the end to the Ben Ali regime. Now, months later in Morocco, the regime faced a strikingly similar situation. As in Tunisia, citizens had begun a protest movement calling for a solution to the country's economic crisis and a host of democratic reforms to the regime. Yet in contrast to Tunisia, Moroccan unions remained relatively distant from these demands. As one unionist, pictured in the May Day demonstrations above put it, we are marching because we wish to push for a social agenda that has nothing to do with the political agenda of the pro-democracy movement. Now, as a political scientist hearing about these two scenarios, I found myself puzzled. I mean, here we had two countries with seemingly similar economic crises, one in which a union champions a protest movement that outs a dictator, and another in which unions stand idly by in the background and the status quo prevails. And it's this stark dichotomy that presented me with the question that is at the heart of my presentation to you today. Why, in authoritarian regimes, do some unions choose to engage in anti-regime protests while others do not? And more important, what does this engagement mean for the success of pro-democracy movements writ large? Now, in attempting to answer this first question, I considered a number of different explanations. I looked at differences in unions' organizational features and their economic grievances and their structural conditions, all of which seemed to suggest that Tunisian and Moroccan unions were actually much more similar than they were different. And so then I turned to the lessons of my discipline, and I considered whether there might be any political explanations that could account for differences in Moroccan and Tunisian unions' protest behavior. In particular, I wondered if there was any connection between a union's level of, of embeddedness within the political institutions of the state and their willingness to protest against it. The logic here is rather simple. The more incorporated a union was within the state apparatus, I believed, the less willing it should be to want to protest against the leaders of that state in the future. Yet while this concept is theoretically straightforward, the task of finding empirical evidence that would allow me to measure unions' political connect connectedness to the state was actually much more difficult. To do this, I poured through hundreds of thousands of microfilms, of government documents, of newspaper articles, and elections material, and I also, also traveled to Tunisia and Morocco for about 18 months to conduct 120 interviews um, in order to uncover any informal relationships between unions and the state that might not have appeared in the official press. And what I found is that there were actually very stark differences between Moroccan and Tunisian unions in terms of their level of incorporation within the state. In particular, I found that Moroccan unionists occupied at least 10% more parliamentary seats held five more high-ranking government appointments, and at least 20% more top party leadership positions than their Tunisian counterparts, making them much more deeply embedded within the state apparatus. But how do these political appointments actually affect unions' protest behavior? Well, I argue that it does so in two ways. First, political positions serve as one way of financially tying unions to the regime, making them much more reluctant to openly oppose it. As the proverb goes, you should not bite the hand that feeds you. And in Morocco, the hand that feeds organized labor is the state, both metaphorically and literally. A Moroccan unionist serving in parliament, for example, stands to make up to nine times the amount of the average Moroccan citizen, a portion of which gets paid directly to the union as a subsidy. By contrast, in Tunisia, where unionists make up less than 1% of all seats in government, unions must rely almost exclusively on dues paid by their members to remain financially solvent. And this brings me to the second reason why unions' political networks so critically affect their protest behavior. Tied to the regime through these networks of privilege and prestige, Moroccan unions effectively become clients of the regime and thus fail to perform their intended functions as representatives of their members. As statistics on their leadership activities show, they use their heightened political capital to remain in office nearly five times the amount of Tunisian unionists, 
and they are consistently rated as ruling in a less democratic fashion than their Tunisian counterparts. As a result of this lack of democratic accountability, Moroccan union leaders often fail to support the militant actions of their members, leading movements that begin at the base, such as the one pictured here in 2011 did, to languish and eventually die out. By contrast, in Tunisia, where union leaders are much more beholden to the wishes of their members, protest movements with inauspicious beginnings can evolve and eventually expand into national movements for political change. Now, in closing this presentation, I want to address the lingering question here. What can the cases of Tunisia and Morocco actually tell us about political developments in the larger world? Well, I want to argue that the cases discussed here speak to a broader connection between labor unions and political democracy that we see replicated throughout the globe. Not only, as I have shown you here, do unions with more autonomy from the state serve as more democratic representatives of their members, but they can also better serve to enhance democracy and the regime writ large. As the experiences of several countries, Poland, South Korea, South Africa, Brazil, and others show, where unions become involved in anti-regime protest, dictators typically fall, paving the way for the consolidation of successful democracies. By contrast, where they do not, autocracies often survive and endure. Thus, if we are concerned with enhancing global democracy, I argue that we should be particularly attuned to the behavior of labor organizations, as these may be the secret key of success for pro-democracy movements around the globe. <laughs>